Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 160, Patents, Copyrights, and Trademarks. Oh my, what you can and cannot use from an existing game. We're here wandering through the future of our past, and I am Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself. I am Mo Tuzino, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. Welcome and thanks for joining us, especially those of you here live in our chat room tonight. So tonight, we answer a question about using the mechanics from an older game in your current game design. And we're going to spend some time talking about copyright, intellectual property, trademarks, and patents in regards to tabletop games. Now, after that, I've got a review of Disney Sidekicks, which, like IP law, is much more complicated than you would expect. We, of course, finish with our usual week in review, including some more thoughts on Arnak and Doodle Dungeon, and a game we tried to play that's older than I am. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Up first, quick comment on our Yardmaster review on YouTube. Patrick Nickel from Crash Games wrote, Fun video, a nice blast from the past for me. Good job. Well, thanks, Patrick. It's always great when a publisher discovers our videos. Andre Thanhauser, who's becoming quite the regular contributor to this segment, left a comment on our best of 2021 post. Have you already got the chance to play Aventuria in the Black Boar? That one is really fantastic and adds a vibe of a dungeon crawler. This box has the biggest content and the highest replayability of all released boxes. So I have a copy of it. It's literally sitting behind me. You can't see it because it's behind my chair. Um, it's sitting there with the rest of the stuff we got from Ulysses Spiel. And when I got the stuff, I was like, I don't know what to do with all this stuff. So I wrote my contact, Eric, there. And I was like, hey, what order do I do with this? Like, like what should I open first? And he gave me a specific list which uh basically matched the release order so you got the original game then uh forest no return then um ship of lost souls and so on uh but with some interjection so what do you recommend is i open the arsenal right away in the wheel of life expansions because those give you components to play and he also suggested that i could do any of the hero packs at any time because then you get more heroes to use in the other games so we've been kind of mixing those in at this point, going through that list, the next thing for us to play is Ship of Stone, which is the bridge module set expansion that combines Ship of Lost Souls and Forest of No Return in some way. Now, I did record an unboxing video for that. It's good to go. We just haven't released it yet. Now, after that, we plan to check out the um, Magistra of Alchemy hero set, which I've also unboxed. I think that one's already live, and try out that character. And then I wanted to unbox next the Treasure Hunter hero set. After that, I was thinking into the Black Boar. But uh, you know what? Maybe I'll jump it ahead. Because beyond that, I've also got beyond the end of the Black Boar, which is another like bridging you play it after end of the Black Boar. So it sounds like there's even more content for that. I got to say thanks for the heads up. Andre, you obviously know the game way better than we do. We're still kind of fumbling through it and learning as we go. You do have me wanting to jump to that. Um, and you know what, to be honest, if it was open, it probably is what I play next, but I'm probably going to get through the stuff I've already opened before I get into that one. Also from our best of 2021 episode, Jonathan commented, if you love space base, check out bad company. All right. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, this isn't the first person to say that I've actually gotten this recommendation a few times recently, um, on Twitter, on Facebook, and I'm intrigued, but I've got to say the idea of building up a street gang. Right? Like your resource management is forming a street gang just honestly does nothing for me. Like I'm much more interested in deploying spaceships or collecting adventurers for that style of game. Based on how many people are telling me to play it, Jonathan included, I probably should give Bad Company another look. Enough. Now next up, a comment on our Galaxy Trucker unboxing video. Theodore Thierry writes, I uh, I was on the fence if I wanted to buy this for my collection for a long time. I did not know that they released a second edition. Mm -hmm. After watching your review, I decided to pull the trigger. Just got delivered today and going to play it this weekend with my kids. Oh, great to hear it, Theodore. I, I am a big fan of the new edition of Galaxy Trucker. I strongly recommend it for anyone who hasn't 
played Galaxy Trucker before or doesn't have it. Now, as for the people who do own a copy, what I suggest you do is check out our review from last week's episode or over on the blog to find out if it's worth it for you to get the new edition of Galaxy Trucker. Finally, I want to thank Grand Gamers Guild for a great shout out on Twitter that said, mm -hmm. at Tabletop Bellhop, you do an excellent job and deserve much more recognition than you get with a link to our show on Apple Podcast. Uh, thanks so much for the shout out, Mark. I definitely appreciate you trying to spread the word about our show. Well, that's it for this week's comment. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. With all the talk of Winnie the Pooh entering the public domain, I found an interesting intellectual property related question in our pile of questions, and I thought it'd be interesting to bring up now. Before we get to that, though, a disclaimer. Neither of us are lawyers or have any legal background. While the information we present here tonight is carefully researched from credible sources, nothing we say should, tonight should be taken as official legal advice. Yeah, while I may have played a lawyer once in an RPG, I haven't taken a single law course. Now, out of the question, Abe Bloom sent us an email that said, Hi, thanks for being available for help. If a game has been patented for more than 20 years, is it legal to use the card mechanics? Is it still covered by intellectual property? Regarding card mechanics, if a game is played with numbers, shapes, and colors, and the goal of the game is to collect matches, can I still play this exact game if I change the numbers or shapes or colors to a different factor such as size? Well, thanks for the great question, Abe. Now, this is something I see come up time and time again online, on forums, on Board Game Geek, Twitter, and I've even had it come up at local gaming events when talking to people about games, especially when talking to people considering making games of their own. There seems to be quite a bit of confusion about this topic, and we're going to do what we can tonight to try to clear some of that up to the best of our ability. Again, we're not lawyers. Well, again, I'm not a lawyer or legally <laughs> trained either. As a photographer, I have spent more than my fair share working to make sure that I understand certain aspects of IP law well enough to help protect my own work. Now, do I need to say we're not lawyers again, or have we got it covered? I think we got it at this point. Say something eight times, people remember it. All right, let's start with the easy part. This is pretty simple. Game mechanics can't be copyrighted. It is very difficult to protect game mechanics. You are free to use the mechanics in any game ever published, and anyone can take the mechanics in your game and use them in yours. And there, sorry. This is the reason you see so many versions and variations of classic games, so many roll and moves, so many skip a turns. Monopoly being, of course, the most popular and most obvious game that has a million knockoffs with a, official Hasbro versions, along with other companies putting out their own versions. Heck, one of the companies we work with regularly now, and whose games we actually enjoy quite a bit, their non-monopoly versions, is The Op, which actually started out as USAopoly as a company that was originally created to sell uniquely themed versions of Monopoly. So the problem is, while this is mostly true today, it wasn't always the case. And it isn't, in fact, 100% true that you can't protect game mechanics. You can't copyright game mechanics. And you can't trademark game mechanics, but many games have had their specific combination of mechanics patented. Monopoly, in fact, was patented and protected from 1935 until 1952, at which time the term of its patent expired. Similarly, Magic the Gathering's process of a trading card game method of play was patented in 1994, and its protection only expired in 2014. Now, for something more related to hobby games, so well, I shouldn't say more related to hobby games when we're talking about the gathering, but board game wise, um, a few years back, a company made a card for card copy of Seven Wonders. All they did was change the names and the artwork on the cards. This was produced for promotional purposes with 2000 copies made, and it was never available for sale, but was distributed to people who belonged in this company. All of that was perfectly legal. Now, that's not to say it should have been done. And I got to say, the gaming community came down hard on this company when Rob Davio, the designer of Seven Wonders, discovered it. And now, I got to say, it takes quite the deep dive on the net to even find reference to this scandal. 
What they did, though, from a legal standpoint, was fine. Now, whether they should have done it or not is a totally different matter. Beyond the legal issues is the harsh court of opinion. Plagiarism is something taken very seriously, mm -hmm. and while in small amounts may not cross into any legally enforceable issues, as others before have discovered, being called out for such actions can, at best, draw significant negative attention to your work, and at worst, lead to an inability to get your product to market at all. For an example of an issue where literally no laws were broken, and yet a game was brought to its knees, one only has to look at the 2019 release of Alien USCSS Nostromo by Wonder Dice and the claims of plagiarism by designer Francois Bachelard. Now, what I think is a logical progression from this is the fact that if game mechanics can't be copyrighted or don't fall under intellectual property, except in rare cases using patents to protect them, and, and that, again, is only, as Sean mentioned, for specific combinations of mechanics used together in a unique way, what can we do to protect or what can a designer do to protect their tabletop game? And the opposite side of the coin, what can't you freely use from another game? And here I'm going to be passing over the reins to Sean as he's done a lot more research on this topic and has more background in IP law due to his photography business. Now, remember, if you actually have questions about the law, seek a, a lawyer. That's now, not us, remember? Now, to quote from the American Bar Association specifically, board games occupy a nexus of the three primary forms of intellectual property protection, copyright, trademark, and patent. Copyright is a form of protection provided by the law for a original works of authorship allowing the holder to be the only person able to copy, distribute, or otherwise share a work under the law. Now, when it comes to copyright, ideas versus expressions are the key concept one needs to grasp. For instance, Roll Two Dice and Move Your Piece is not a copyrightable expression, or, but the specific wording of the rules governing that mechanism are when it's set down in a rule book, are copyrightable, just as the words to your novel are. No matter how intricate and convoluted you wish to make your game, it is unlikely that its actual game mechanisms will have any protection under copyright. The imagery, artwork, text of the rules, and specific game text, if it's long enough, those are copyrightable works. So I was wondering uh, if you had any examples. Like the one that comes to mind is everyone in the gaming industry knows that Wizards of the Coast did something, and I can't even remember what, to protect tapping. You weren't allowed to use the word tapping. Hey, Roger, in the chat, perfect timing, just said tapping is patented. So the exact wording from the Magic the Gathering rulebook is to tap a card is to turn it sideways to show that it's been used for the turn. Is that copyrightable? So that sentence is not. But the rules, the set of rules, the book of rules is copyrightable uh, and using significant portions of it are the same as copying chunks of my novel, uh, you know, paragraphs out of my novel and using that. Uh, is, and so they are protectable. Uh, the Magic the Gathering thing is very complex. Uh, again, in our chat room, Roger has pointed out tapping is patented and the answer is no. No, it's not. But we'll get to that. So bodies of text are copyrightable. So the rule book for Magic is a copyrighted document, but the tapping of the card is a process that we'll get to later. Now, next yes. up, trademarks are a way to identify a product and its source as unique in the marketplace. And now mm -hmm. marketplace is a key term because if you are a game, your marketplace is the, the realm of games and gaming and hobbies it's not uh, selling refrigerators. So <laughs> there isn't any crossover between. So you're, you're, you could both, Monopoly could both be the name of a refrigerator company and the name of a board game, and there is no trademark problem. I was just thinking about that. Actually. <laughs> now we got to make a name <laughs> game called Frigidaire. So now a game's name, character names, logos, graphic designs, and so on, if not generic, are potential trademarks. 
Parker Brothers, in fact, lost the trademark on Monopoly due to its becoming generic, a ruling which actually got Congress to change the law to protect other companies from losing their trademarks in the same method that Parker Brothers did. Unfortunately, it was already too late for Monopoly, which has not had an active trademark on the word or the name of the game since 1983. Other Opoly games, however, fill the registration office, thanks in part to our friends at the Op. Yeah, I'm sure they have trademarked all of those various versions. Now, on the other hand, Hasbro does hold trademarks for a wide variety of designs in Monopoly, mm -hmm. including, but not limited to, the jail, go to jail, free parking, uh, chance, the railroad logo, and even the board layout. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing to note about a trademark is it not only must be in use, it must be continued to be in use, and you must prove ongoing proof of its continued use in commerce is the legal term they use. So two quick things on that. One of them is I've been told this, and I'm sure it's true. This is one of the reasons Milton Bradley reproduces, or Hasbro nowadays, Hasbro republishes their games every X years. That's why you'll get a new Twister, you'll get a new Monopoly, you'll get Battleship with planes instead of single ship boats, you'll get Monopoly with new pieces, it is to keep that trademark in place. Absolutely. You, you really, uh, I believe it's every five years or 10 years, depending on the country, um, that you have to prove to the uh, government that you are mm -hmm. still using this word and you are still protecting it as, as your property. Now, I also, as far as I know, this is also why all, every knockoff version of Monopoly has free parking and jail with the same artwork, even though you may be playing a game with Jedi and Sith. Right. Now, I know another thing here that we get into um, with legal disputes, and one of the big reasons is brands trying to um, protect their brands, stop what they call brand dilution. Now, again, going back to Wizards of the Coast and moving away from Monopoly, but moving into Dungeons and Dragons, there was a lot of buzz with this and them enforcing their trademark through third-party publishers putting out D&D content and it looking like theirs. So there are a bunch of rules you can't break, like you can't use the D&D ampersand. The dragon ampersand yeah, the is, ampersand a trademark is a trademark of, Absolutely. Is a, a, a trademark of Hasbro. So you can't put that D&D logo anywhere in your book. But not only that, the layout for a D&D 5e book is set with like the titles here. This is on the spine. This is in this thing. You can't copy that either. And basically, Wizards of the Coast doesn't want anyone to go to a store and think that book you wrote was written by them. Right. And that's where we get into the generic concept, right? This is Kleenex is no mm -hmm. longer a trademarked term because it became generic. Kleenex is facial tissue. Everyone just calls it Kleenex. Uh, it became generic, exactly. So uh, while there is a brand Kleenex, they have no trademark protection over that because mm -hmm. everyone just thinks of facial tissue as Kleenex. It's a generic term. And I think this is part of why was the Coast fight so hard when everyone just calls every role-playing game D&D. &D. Absolutely. They don't want, oh, it's Dungeons & Dragons or it's like Dungeons & Dragons to be the common knowledge. Uh, for instance, uh, Wizards of the Coast, Lysa LLC, just Wizards of the Coast LLC, has five pages of trademarks listed right now that I found just with a quick Google search. And that's yeah. just Wizards of the Coast, not Hasbro uh, in general. Yeah. So, and, and, you know, the ampersand, all the various title the fonts. fonts of, of you know, all their different Mm -hmm. um, areas of D and D are all covered out, yeah. covered there in detail. Mountain Papa points out another good example of this frisbee, and I'm mm -hmm. sure Yo Yo would be the same thing. Yep, no, absolutely. Now, having explained why your game mechanisms aren't copyrightable, they may be patentable as utility patents. Yeah. Now, this is a vastly more expensive and onerous process than any of the above by a great deal. A designer must demonstrate to the patent office that the game mechanics in question are both unique and non-obvious. Now that means no one else can know about or have used them and 
someone with, and the definition is ordinary skill in game design for this, mm -hmm. for our purposes, must not be able to come up with that concept all on their own. Right. So roll 2d6 and move is clearly not unique. But similarly, making the player roll 2d20 is hardly something that another game designer wouldn't immediately think of. So it's not, or it isn't non-obvious. And quite frankly, if I can think of it listed here as a non-game designer, it's not going to be non-obvious enough to meet the standards of a patent. And one of the things you got to watch is if Sean did mention it here, it would no longer be patentable even if it was non-unique and new. So here is where Magic was able to scare people with legal actions about tapping cards. Now... I cannot find any current trademark issues with the word tapping. The tap symbol, however, is unquestionably trademarked. But Magic the Gathering did have a patent on their rule system, including the tapping of lands, resources, uh, for until 2014. That has expired, however, and is no longer a, valent, a, val a valid patent. What I find interesting is no one's using tapping now. Is it just the fact people have gotten used to they shouldn't use tapping? Or are they just like, I don't want to be compared to magic? Yeah, I honestly can't find any legal reason why you can't go ahead and use tapping at this at this particular point in time. Yeah, uh, I like, think the, the the one of the reasons may be that tapping is so intimately associated with that logo and that graphic yeah, that, that it becomes a problem because that is a trademark. Right. <laughs> Now, if you are able to claim a patent on your mechanisms, you are protected from a for a term from the date you applied for protection, not the date it was granted, and the length of that term varies by the type of patent and mm. country, uh, 15 to 20 years, depending on <laughs> a couple of things. So I was thinking about this and what, what out there in gaming, like since I've been playing games, what completely new ideas came along? The first one that popped into my head was deck building. So for years, we've had deck construction. And even technically deck construction going further back possibly was new. But the fact that you have an existing deck of cards, that everyone starts with the same deck of cards at the start of the game, and during the game, you add cards to the deck. I wonder if that is something that could have been patented when it came out, which as far as I know, no, it was not Dominion. I know for sure it wasn't Dominion. I think the first game to use this was actually the StarCraft board game from Fantasy Flight Games. And Fantasy Flight at that time should have been big enough to do it if they wanted to. Does this seem like it'd be patentable or is that? You know what? It, it, it so depends on if at the time of its creation, it would have been considered both unique and non-obvious. And see, the people of the world at the time, the <laughs> gamers thought so. And so <laughs> was potentially, yes. Uh, but it also wouldn't just have been the aspect of deck building, uh, as we see in the Magic patent, which is an 18-page patent, not including clarifications and, and, and artwork. Mm -hmm. uh, it is the entire system. So you're describing everything you can, essentially, in order to gain that protection, not just a narrow aspect right. of that uh which I think the number of, we'll call them magic clones out there, points out that, yes, you can use lots of that as long as you do your own thing with it because they patented the whole package. Right. Therefore, individual parts of that package aren't protected. So I began by mentioning that it is an expensive and onerous process. It also may not be possible mm. if, for instance, you playtested your game in any public setting as a con or developer fest before your application was submitted, which is a, a real kick in the pants to almost yeah, every that's... game designer. Uh, well, the well, you have to play test, right? Like, so you you can actually play test under NDA, okay. but you can't. Uh, it's it's it, the public is the issue. So if you go right. to a con, which is considered a public setting, and play it there, it's hmm. no longer patentable. Uh, I actually so, wonder if that's why com so many companies are using NDAs. Because I'm like, as a content creator, Almost I'm certainly. always like, why? Why are you putting me under an NDA? Monty Cook Games. I wasn't allowed to talk about Numenera at all when I was doing. And and that that, that. does actually save them from this, that, this that's specific. That's probably what it is. That makes problem. more sense than we don't want someone to steal our ideas, which is always the vibe I got. Yeah. And I'm like, as Roger pointed 
out in the, the chat room earlier. No one's out there to steal your ideas. Game designers don't do that. There's no um, no uh, swipe or no swiping in the game industry, really. Now, furthermore, a court ruling in 2014 uh, that was actually specifically about accounting procedures okay. uh, invalidated what was the digital implementation of abstract ideas, uh, which is a weird and, and legalese term but basically, if you've got an idea and make a computer do it, you're not allowed to patent it just because you you had an idea and found a way to make a computer do it. The problem is, uh, if you have an idea and find a way to make a game do it, that is almost certainly uh, the legal opinion is leaning uh, to also not be patentable. Um, so okay. it's it's an interesting, it has not been tested in court. But it is looking more than likely that uh, if you just because you have an idea, the implementation of an abstract idea into another system isn't enough to patent. It's it's a weird legal. That sounds hole. like it would tie in with all your <laughs> digital tabletops and everything. Yeah, so like, it's, like it's, prototyping on tabletop simulator, I think somehow would be mixed in it's, that. It's a it's a deep rabbit hole. Uh, feel free to. <laughs> to go with whoever wants to. I'm not going any deeper into yeah. that one. So the interesting thing is, the reason is we're having this, this discussion about patents specifically, patents are very protective. Hence the need to make them difficult to acquire and relatively short-lasting compared to other forms of IP protection. Trademarks, for instance, last for as long as you are using and enforcing the trademark Mm -hmm. Copyrights last for either 50 or 70 years after the death of the author, depending on uh, the country and, and where you all are. And then finally, we have design patents. Okay. And now these can protect unique and non-obvious ornamental objects, but not any method of use for that mm -hmm. object. So this would be applicable for game piece design to ensure other games didn't use similar objects. So Hans and Gluck could have tried to get a design patent on the Meeple when they published Carcassonne. And so actually in this case, he would have failed due to the similarities with Europa 1945 to 2030, which was released in 1998. And the similarities between the figures from Europa and the meeple from, uh, or like, they weren't actually called meeple in oh, meeple Carcassonne. No, meeple in modern terms. Uh, but, uh, and, and the figures in Carcassonne were too similar and probably, and Europa would have been called uh, previous work and right. invalidated the patent. So to step it back one, so Descartes Editeur should have tried to patent <laughs> their figures. And then we wouldn't even have the term meeple in our vocabulary because Carcassonne probably would have put out pawns. There you go. So once a game is made, it doesn't end there. As we are all too aware of, board games can be published by many different companies. And depending on the agreements entered into with these entities, rights may become complicated. May. <laughs> I think they just do. For instance, if publisher B creates an expansion for game A, neither the game creator nor publisher C may have any rights to that expansion contest and unless details were explicit in those publishing contracts. And beyond that, we have not even yet discussed the issues of other people's art in board games and what mm -hmm. rights have been assigned to the creator by artists, potentially limiting future releases of the game or releases in foreign territories. This is actually one of the big things that keeps games from getting republished. Uh, it's one of the reasons Hero Quest took so long to come back to print, um, which also leads into the issues of licensing, which I am not going to talk about here because that is a completely different legal ball of wax we're not going to touch. But be aware that licensing issues are a thing and make sure you have the license to publish something before you publish it or use it. Now, this is, of course, all made vastly more complex by the fact that what I have described here, for the most part, only applies in the United States, and protection in that jurisdiction may or more likely may not apply elsewhere. Patents, for instance, are only valid in the country in which you apply, so you need to apply for in every country you would like a patent. Copyright is granted the moment a work is fixed, 
Uh, so the the moment you sort of finalized it, basically. Um, mm -hmm. But in the U.S., you need to actually register your copyright uh, in order to have any legal yeah. uh, activity, whereas other countries, that isn't a requirement at all. Which that I know is true in Canada. You do not have to file for copyright. It is implied when you make a creative work. Now, one thing to note was to disabuse an old myth. myth. Mailing yourself something and leaving it's... it in a sealed envelope in order to use the postmark as proof has never been a valid protection for one's intellectual property. I still hear this one all the time. I probably in the last month I've seen someone tweet it. Well, it might sway a jury. If you're in a case co court, you might have some people on the side listening and you might be able to sway them with that. Uh, the poor man's copyright, as it's called, is not a legal form of protection in any way, shape or form. Absolutely. So now we get back <laughs> after back all this. Abe. Back to the specific question. So if a game has been patented for more than 20 years is the first phrase. Mm. So it's either patented or it's not. It's either patented or the patent has expired. A or there never was one. A search of the specific patent can easily determine its current status. If its status is expired, then no legal action regarding that patent can be brought forth by the former patent holder. That's the one where right now you should be able to use tap, as far as we can tell. So is it still covered by intellectual property is the next statement. And yeah. if it is still for sale, and if it hasn't been 70 years since the creator died, probably yes, in some form. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So knowing what is and isn't covered by intellectual property is important here as well. Absolutely. So regarding card mechanics. These might have been patentable, but are unprotected by any other IP law in the U.S. outside of the patent office. So mm -hmm. if the patent has expired, then you are free to use the mechanics by using different copyrightable or trademarkable graphic designs in your implementation. Mm -hmm. Be aware, though, that your description in the rules could conceivably and unintentionally violate copyright if you were to use the same wording to describe the mechanics and gameplay as the original rule book, which as we discussed, can be copyrighted. Yeah, which is actually where the problem with that Seven Wonders game, there might have been an issue. It looked like they copy pasted the rule book and changed the icons to their new icons. So there might have been a real problem. Now, what Abed says, can I still play the exact game if I change the number, shapes, or colors to a different factor such as size? So first off, you can't copy another game's design or artwork. That's intellectual property. So it would depend on what these numbers and shapes are. Are they unique or are they generic? If it's generic numbers and shapes, you can probably use them as long as your copy version is noticeably distinguishable. Now, if they're unique shapes, there's a chance you can't. So I'm thinking of the game set. Like I'm, I'm actually wondering if Abe is thinking of copying the game set because that's when he described it, I'm like, that sounds like set. Well, there's certain S shapes in that game that I would not call generic. So you wouldn't be able to use those. And I've got to say, even if they are unique shapes, or the, making them bigger doesn't make your version unique. Because he actually said a factor such as size. I don't think producing a large print version of a game without permission is going to go over very well. But the biggest thing about all of this to me in this entire discussion, and every time it comes up, is that in general, as a game designer, you don't want to copy an existing game, even if you can, even if it's 100% legal. There are thousands and thousands of games out there with new games being released all the time. Why copy an already existing game? If you like that game so much, play that game. If it's out of print, maybe look into getting the rights to the original and republishing it. Yes, taking existing mechanics from games and combining them in new ways is how we get new games, and that's perfectly cool. That's how the hobby and board gaming evolves, by making new versions of something out there. I just don't see the point of recreating something identical. It just it seems lazy to me. I just don't get it. And trust me, board game designers don't make the money you think they do if you think by copying an existing game, you're going to get rich quick. And all of this is without mentioning the fact the board game community as a whole really does not appreciate knockoffs or plagiarism in any form. 
And unless you happen to be trying to republish the, uh, the existing game for a completely new market that doesn't include any board gamers, which why you would do that, I don't know. You're going to get a lot of heat, especially in today's days of the internet. Maybe back in the 80s when we weren't all connected, you could publish something and no one would know you copied it. But nowadays, someone's going to notice. Absolutely. So that's it for our discussion on tabletop game patents, copyright, and trademarks. Remember, none of what we just said should be considered legal advice. If you're looking to protect your game or use something from someone else's game, we still recommend you get legal yes. counsel. Now we're here to answer your gaming game night questions. If you've got a question for us, like the one we had tonight or something completely different, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Welcome to our review of the cooperative board game, Disney Sidekicks. Thanks, Spin Master, for sending us a review copy of this game to check out. Disney's Sidekicks was designed by Eric M. Lang and features artwork from Greg May. It was published in 2021 by Spin Master Games. Now, the game says two to four players on the box, though I honestly don't see any reason you couldn't play this solo, like many cooperative games. Now, a game of Sidekicks takes under an hour, sometimes way under an hour, if you've got some bad luck going on. Sidekicks has an MSRP of $30, $29.99 specifically, and should be available through both the mass market and hobby game retail chains. Now, in Disney Sidekicks, players get to kick it into hero mode as one of five popular Disney sidekicks working together with the other players to rescue their heroes and defeat at least one of Disney's most infamous villains. Along the way, they will have to deal with the villain henchmen, defeat guards, and rescue villagers in order to learn new skills for their sidekicks. Check out our Disney Sidekicks unboxing video on YouTube for a look at the components you get with this game. Now quickly, you get a rulebook that features one of the best component overviews I've seen in a game, as well as a useful gameplay summary on the back. I wish more publishers did both of these things. There's a nice looking two-sided board, which is used at different player counts. The board box does come with a single rather thin cardboard punch port that holds some of the smallest tokens I've ever seen in a board game. These are so tiny, I was going to be worried that I, I would, blah. wow, English, not working. These are so tiny, I was worried I would lose some just while unboxing the game for the first time. And this is always a concern, especially depending on the age ranges that a game is targeted at. Correct. Now, other components include oversized cards for the sidekicks and villains, standard size danger cards and power cards, a custom six-sided die, a plastic castle and bridges, and miniatures for the sidekicks and villains. And I gotta say, I was especially impressed by these miniatures. I can see a Disney van buying this game just for those miniatures. All right, well, now that we have an idea of what you get in the box, how about you give us an overview of how Disney sidekicks is played? All right, pretty simple. Start by putting the board out on its appropriate side, put the castle in the middle, and add all the bridges. Seed the board with guards and villagers, and then have everyone pick a sidekick. Now, the sidekicks included in this game are Abu from Aladdin, Lumiere from Beauty and the Beast, Timon and Pumbaa from The Lion King, Tinkerbell from Peter Pan, and the three fairy godmothers, who count as one character, from Sleeping Beauty. For each sidekick, the player is going to collect their character card, their miniature, which is placed on a starting spot, a reference card, a health token placed at the end of their health track, one star token, and their hero token, note hero is different than the sidekick, which is placed inside the castle. Players then shuffle their power cards and draw three, which they place face up. Remaining power cards are returned to the box. So a nice range of characters from a wide range of properties across more than 50 years mm -hmm. of Disney history. Yeah, I think they did a really good job of grabbing iconic characters here. Because next up, you get the villains. Each sidekick has a matching villain. Now, in the same order as before, you have Jafar, Gaston, Scar, Captain Hook, and of course, Maleficent. You're going to follow the setup instructions on the back of each villain card. These vary by villain. So, for example, Hook has you place a token out for the Jolly Roger in one of the, uh, the river areas, whereas Maleficent has you place curse tokens on specific areas of the map. So, <clears throat> uh, a bit of asymmetry in the setup, but by way of the opponents of your chosen characters rather than your yes. own characters. So there is some asymmetry with the characters, which I'll get into when I start describing their abilities. 
Now, finally, you're going to build the danger deck. What you're going to do is collect all the cards for the villains in play and add two standard danger cards that are used every game and shuffle these all together. Now, if somehow you are finding the game too easy, you also have three additional sets of danger cards that can be added to make things more difficult, ranging from almost impossible to even the designer can't win it, as far as I can tell. I very strongly suggest forgetting these even exist. I originally read this as Danger Duck, and now I'm disappointed. Now, is that a Disney license, Danger Duck? I, I remember Darkwing Duck. Hey, yeah, it's Danger, yeah, that's Danger, Danger Duck. Duck. Yeah. That, that one's past my Disney knowledge. Now, gameplay in Disney Sidekicks is similar to many other popular cooperative games where on a player's turn, something bad happens, then the player gets to act, spending a set amount of action points to choose between different actions. Now, victory is achieved if the players manage to save all of the heroes and defeat at least one villain. Now, defeat for the hero or hero sidekicks, sorry, I always want to say heroes because I just think you usually play the heroes, right? So defeat for the sidekicks for the players can come in many forms. The players lose if even one sidekick is defeated, if three bridges on the board are destroyed, if the castle is filled with a mix of five guards or villagers, or if a villain's specific defeat condition is reached. These are on the specific villain cards. For example, if Maleficent gets all her curse tokens out, you lose the game. So pretty standard, a lot of ways to lose, mm. since as we've discussed often before, co-op games shouldn't be too easy to win, or where's the fun in playing? Only true. Now, each game start, each turn, going around the table, starts with drawing a danger card. These will have you complete up to three steps, with most cards having all three, some not having all of them. Starting by adding villagers to the map. Now, if at any point, when adding villagers to the map, you end with three villagers in the same spot, one's captured and sent to the castle. Remember, if the castle ever has five villagers and or guards, the players lose. Remember, social distancing, don't crowd up. Well, there you go. The game's even timely. Next is the Danger Rises phase. Uh, this is the middle part of the card. You're just going to read it out loud and do what it says. These type of events lead to things like um, different things happening on the board, and they're based on what villain card deck it comes from. So, for example, Hook will have the Jolly Roger attack anyone who's adjacent to that river, or Maleficent will start cursing more areas of the board. Finally, on the last part of the card, you will either place a guard token where the sidekick who's going is, or the appropriate villain will move towards that their sidekick. Sorry, not necessarily the one who drew the card, but the matching sidekick, and then stop and attack any adjacent sidekicks from where they end up. Now, I talked about attacks here. These are made by rolling a custom die a number of times equal to the number of attack tokens on the villain. Uh, for example, Scar has three, whereas Maleficent has one. Now, you roll the die, and if you have like these scratch marks, those count as hits from the villains and that each hit removes one health from the sidekick. The sidekick ever runs out of health, of course, the players lose. Now, when placing guards, because some of these cards will tell you to place guards, if there are ever two guard tokens in the same spot, they don't need the reinforcement, and one moves back to the castle. Remember, if you get a mix of five guards or villagers in the castle, you lose. Again, pretty standard for co-op stuff. You do the bad thing, then you do a specific opponent bad thing, Check to make sure nothing horrible has ended things, and then the player can finally go. Yeah, this is familiar to many other co-op games. So assuming you haven't lost at this point, which can be a pretty big assumption, you then get to take actions with your hero. Each hero has either three or four action points to spend. Actions include moving your sidekick to an adjacent spot, jumping over any spots occupied by other sidekicks or villains. Note, if you move on to a spot with a guard or henchman, they will attack you. Your next option is to attack a henchman in your spot or an adjacent villain, because the miniatures never are on the same spot. And it has to be a villain you haven't attacked yet this turn, which is a weird way of saying you can only attack each villain once. You can unlock the castle, the gates, by spending five star tokens. There's lock tokens for this that you flip to the unlock side. If there's an unlock token at the castle, you can then spend that to free your hero. And finally, you can, or sorry, not finally, you can also rescue villagers. You move your around the board to where the villagers are and you rescue them by removing them from the board and you potentially gain a new power. I'll get into that in a moment. The final action is resting, which allows you to either recover one health or gain one star. Note, you can only rest once per turn, no matter how many actions you have. Right, so a, a pretty normal list of possible actions. They're not limiting you, but they're also not making it easy to decide mm. what you might want to do on a turn. 
Yeah, this is a little more complex than even, say, Pandemic, which is considered by many a gateway cooperative game. You have more possible things you can do in this game. Now, we talked about attacks again. Attacking with a sidekick, again, uses the custom die, but you're looking for Mickey's glove, showing a thumbs up this time, and every Mickey's glove does one damage to the target. Now, most henchmen are removed from the board if hit, but when villains are hit, you actually remove star tokens from their player board and get them for the player. So this is one of the ways to get star tokens. Now, many villains also have additional rules to follow when they're hit. For example, hitting Maleficent is the way to remove those curse tokens. Now, if a villain loses their last star token, they're defeated, removed from play, along with any of their tokens in play still. Now, remember, the players have to defeat at least one villain to win the game. Now, along with the two different attack symbols on the dice, there's also a side showing a star. If this is rolled at any time, the player rolling gets a star token immediately, regardless if they're rolling for their hero, a villain, or a henchman. So uh, with the makeup of the dice, you do get a 66% chance of your sidekick hitting, though some of those are also a bad guy hit back at you as well, mm -hmm. uh, and a 17% chance of a free star every time you attack. Now, when players rescue a villager, getting back to that, you're going to take the token from the board and you get to place it on one of those three face-up power cards you put out at the start of the game. And it has to go on a power card that doesn't already have a villager of that color on it. Now, each of these cards has two to four spots on it, and once all of them are filled, the player earns that power. Now, each of these powers breaks the rules in some way, giving all kinds of things like additional attacks, more movement, healing re-rolls, uh, gaining stars every turn, and so on. There are a lot of these cards actually included in the game, which actually adds quite a bit to the replay value. Now, along with these power cards, each individual hero also has their own asymmetric power, which they start with at the beginning of the game. For example, Tinkerbell can move anywhere for one movement. Timon and Pumbaa can heal. Lumiere can re-roll dice. Now, one neat bit here that I really like is that each hero can also spend one star token to use their ability on another hero, or sorry, another sidekick during their turn. So Tinkerbell can move someone else, or Timon and Pumbaa can heal another sidekick. So player asymmetry, but a very helpful version of it. Yes. Now, in addition to being one of the win conditions, when a hero is rescued, the sidekick that saved them keeps the token on their player board, and that gives them one additional action each turn. Trust me, you're going to want more actions. Play continues around the table, with every player drawing a dun danger card, doing what it says, and then taking actions until either the players win or the game defeats them. Well, that doesn't sound bad at all. Uh, what is it you thought and your family thought of the game? So the thing with Disney sidekicks is that when you see this game, the, the box for the game, you can't help but expect a light, fun, family weight game with a cool Disney theme that's a little different. You're playing the sidekicks instead of the heroes. That's just neat. Even seeing Eric Lang's name on the box as someone who knows who Eric Lang is, you expect an engaging cooperative experience that kids will love, but that has enough depth that gamers will also have fun playing. You see the game at Target or Walmart or on Amazon and think this is a great game for Disney fans of all ages. The problem is thinking this is wrong. Disney Sidekicks is a fairly complex and wickedly difficult cooperative game that even the most experienced cooperative game players are going to find hard to win. The game is fiddly and punishing without adding in any of the extra difficulty cards. Those ones I basically told you to forget about. Even the basic game as it's designed is difficult. Now added to this, there are some rule book ambiguities that can lead to arguments at the table about the proper way to play the game. And you never want that on a family game. Night. Yeah, well, I'm all about tricky co-ops, but rule book problems, that is a whole other ball of wax. Now, in more detail, that's just kind of an overview of my thoughts on the game. Let, let's start with the components. They are a total mixed bag. I don't think I've ever opened one box and had such mixed feelings about various different components. Now, the miniatures are a highlight. While they're not hobby miniature quality, there's no Games Workshop level minis in this box, they are great representations of the characters they represent. The bridges are also cool. They're 3D, like the piece of plastic, and the castle looks good in the center of the table. So the castle really isn't all that functional. Tossing hero tokens in the middle just makes it a pain to get them out later. And there's no place to put those lock-unlock tokens. And the spots to hold the guard villagers aren't designed to actually hold the guard or villager tokens, which are really tiny. Like each castle tower has an obviously designed hold something circular aspect to it. But the tokens you're meant to put there are much smaller than these towers. 
Even the lock tokens are smaller than these towers. Now, with my kids playing around the game, they did notice one of the miniatures fits perfectly up there, but there's no reason to ever put a miniature in the tower in the game. Like, I almost wonder if the tower was originally designed to serve a different purpose, and then they changed at some point what to do with it, and they never updated it. The hazards of shifting designs after component builds are locked in at manufacturer. Yeah. I don't know. It, it works. It's just odd. Now, the villager guard tokens I just mentioned are the biggest problem with this game, production-wise. Uh, the heart, star, and attack die tokens are the same thing. These are literally the worst tokens I've ever seen in a board game. And I've played a lot of board games. They are thin. They are cardboard. They're not paper. But they're super tiny. Added to that, the villager tokens need to be differentiated. And they feature two colors, an orange and a brown, that are almost identical. And if I don't play with my hue lighting, I can't tell them apart. And that's from someone who doesn't have any vision issues like colorblindness. Ouch. Take that, folks. We're too nice to the games we review. <laughs> now, another issue is the rulebook, as I mentioned. While it's well-designed, lots of examples, well-laid up, there's actually more examples than rules, which is great. There are a few ambiguous rules. Now, on a positive note, Spin Master has published an updated rulebook on their website. and You can go there and download the PDF. The problem with this is that most people buying a mass market Disney game aren't even going to consider looking online for rulebook updates or errata. That's something only hobby gamers tend to know to do. Indeed, while most hobby gamers wouldn't think twice about checking for updates, your average family game night does not involve checking the forums at Board Game Geek. No, it does not. Now, as for the game, it's actually pretty solid. Um, setting up the board with its various villain counters and cards actually gives me a lot of flashbacks to Horrified from uh, Disney's, not Disney, the Universal Monsters Horrified. Uh, and that's a good thing. Actually, quite a bit of the gameplay here reminds me of Horrified in a good way. All the rules seem to work together and work well. Moving around the board, freeing villagers, gaining new powers, and battling henchmen and villagers and um, guards is actually quite fun until you lose suddenly. Because losing in Disney sidekicks is something that's going to happen frequently and early. It is so hard that in one game, we even lost before one player had a chance to take their turn. Though I will note that was on the hardest difficulty level trying those cards I told you just forget about. And this is one of the reasons I'm telling you to forget about. No one wants to play a game where they don't get to take a turn. Now, in most games we've played, we lost due to the castle getting filled up. And that happened mainly to specific danger cards that have you place tokens on a spot and on the spots adjacent to it. This is a mechanic that's similar to outbreaks and pandemic. The limit of only one guard or two villagers on a spot can be extremely punishing. Then you throw Maleficent into the mix, which you're probably gonna wanna do because well, it's Maleficent and plus the fairy godmother's the coolest sidekick with three different little miniatures that can split up, which is really neat. Playing with Melissa makes it worse because those curse tokens instantly send any villager added, no matter what's already on the spot. So I strongly recommend, and here, here's my biggest tip for anyone who, who picks up this game and has listened to this, besides ignore the higher difficulty cards, like literally put them under the insert. Years later, when you've mastered the game, you can pull them out, is don't use Maleficent until you've managed to win a few times. Honestly, I have to say from a frustration perspective, this reminds me a lot of playing through the Monster Box of Monsters with some mm. very similar unfavorable experiences. Yeah, like you literally put that on the shelf. We're yeah. like, we're basically done with that for now. And I can totally see a group doing this. Now, in addition to losing due to the full castle, that was in the games we played the most common. We did have games where we lost due to heroes dying. So even having a character like Timon and Pumbaa, which is the one sidekick who can heal, well, it doesn't help if it takes three turns to get back to Timon and Pumbaa so they can heal again. Now, that's three rounds of danger deck, deck, danger deck draws before you get to use that ability. And while, in theory, you read about a game like this, you're like, well, it's perfectly balanced because every turn, bad things happen, then you go. So it doesn't matter how many players you're playing with. But that's not true in this case. Honestly, the easiest way to win in this game is to play two players and make sure one of those players is Tone and Pumbaa so you can heal every other round. And I would recommend Abu for your second choice because Abu lets you skip over danger cards. On his turn, he draws two cards and 
he discards one to the bottom. So you can throw away those, it's going to outbreak. Well, I'm using the pandemic term, but you can throw away that, put the guard there. You're like, oh, no, we'll do this other one. And by spending a star, you can do it on the other player's turn. So with that team, the game becomes much more winnable. Indeed. Character choice and optimization is a factor in these sort of co-op games. But that's speaking as an experienced gamer yep. and not sitting down with a bunch of eight-year-olds who want to play their favorite characters. Yep. So all that said, Disney sidekicks can be quite fun as long as everyone knows what they're in for when they sit down to play. The key to enjoying this game is making sure all the players clearly understand the various losing conditions and making sure everyone's cool with trying multiple times to win, expecting to lose more often than not. You can have a ton of fun playing this game as long as you go in with the right expectations. A modern complex co-op game and not your hasbro family game night yeah and that's my biggest worry about this game is who it seems to be marketed to. it's a disney themed game sold in mass market stores that's most likely going to get bought by disney fans or as gifts for disney fans who are most likely kids this is it not in any way in my opinion a kids game well the box says eight plus on it i don't know many eight-year-olds that could learn this game on their own nor many who would enjoy the fiddliness and difficulty of this game. To me, Disney Sidekicks is a difficult cooperative game best enjoyed by experienced gamers. And that's not really how it's being sold. Indeed, Disney branding it as one would expect Disney to, but that has shaped expectations. To be fair, I never would have looked twice at this game if it had not had Eric's name on it. Uh, I would have simply assumed that it was a candy-coated kids experience and not a stress-inducing hobby game. So if you're an experienced gamer who enjoys cooperative games and loves a challenge, you may want to pick up Disney Sidekicks, especially if your group enjoys the theme and the license, the whole Disney thing. Lots of Disney fans out there. Now, if you're a fan of difficult cooperative games, and the one that comes to mind to me is Ghost Stories. For years, Ghost Stories has had a reputation of being the most difficult but winnable cooperative game out there. Well, I think it has to pass that throne on to sidekicks. I think if you dug Ghost Stories and you want that kind of challenge, there's stuff you will enjoy in this game. Now, if you're a Disney fan looking for a fun game to play with your family, something that your family will enjoy and gamers will also enjoy, I can't recommend this game. Instead, I recommend checking out Disney Villainous, sorry, Spin Master. This is more of a game that the entire family can enjoy and that I found works great with both new and experienced gamers. Now, if you are really hooked on the theme of sidekicks, I recommend find a way to try before you buy in this case, instead of rushing out to grab this right away. Now, if you just want some cool Disney miniatures, this box, box? This box has some very cool ones. As a bonus, you get a game you might like, you might not. Just don't expect to win very often, if at all, if you do play it. For everyone else, I'm sorry to say this is a skip. Uh, Disney Sidekicks is a game that seems to have missed its mark in a number of ways. It's a game that's confused both in its target market and its component quality. While there's some neat stuff going on here, the way it's all put together keeps me from giving it a general recommendation. Well, that's it for our review of Disney Sidekicks. We'd love to hear what you thought about this game in the comments, and we welcome you to check out our more detailed written review over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. I am going to jump back to one thing that was said in the lobby that I think is a valid question. If you rethemed it, where would you take it? So would you play it? And I've got to say, honestly, the only thing really selling this is that the, I love the idea of sidekicks beating up villains and saving the heroes. And there's even some thematic tie-ins. Like the, the player abilities are all have featured Disney art and they have themed abilities. And, and it's done like Abu's good at stealing things and handing things out to other players. Tinkerbell can teleport all over the place and make people fly. The fairies are the coolest because it's three miniatures, but when they pass over another character, you can attach one of your three fairies to that character, and then they have defenses from any attacks until they get hit. And then when they get hit, the fairy flies back. And like that's all really well done. And I honestly don't think I would have grabbed this 
if it was just yet another co-op game or another fantasy game where I'm trying to rescue prisoners out of a castle. Yeah. So as for games being played, I'm going to stick to physical only games today with a little bit of notes about digital, but I have been playing online. I'm sure Sean's got 18 more games than I do going online, but uh, I'm going to stick to physical plays because we have some. So first up, more plays of Lost Ruins of Arnak. Uh, second play, Deanna and I only, two player at this point, much better than the first. Still pretty much lost on what we should be doing, but I now get all the potential options. I see what I could be doing and why I might want to take specific actions. What I'm really struggling with is what's important when. Should I be rushing up this track? Should I be discovering sites? Should I be fighting monsters and leaving them for later? That I'm still kind of clueless on. We're obviously still learning the game, but man, we are having a lot of fun. This is, I, everyone's been saying it. The, the hype so far is really stands up on this one. I, I am, even though we're fumbling, we're having fun fumbling. And to be honest, exploration is part of the even theme of the game. So in a way, I think they did a good job there that I, I do feel lost in the jungle, not sure what I should do next. So interestingly, uh, we discovered this is on Board Game Arena. Now we mentioned a couple of weeks ago, it's on Tabletop Simulator. But there are a number of reasons we may not want to use Tabletop Simulator, including things we talked about on the show before and stuff we talked about on Sunday Brunch. So Board Game Arena in general, we find is better to play on for learning games and for playing. It's just, it's more elegant. May not look like the game, but more elegant and easy to play. And we are currently in the middle of a three-player game with Sean. And since Sean's also playing that one, I'll let you share your thoughts on Lost Ruins of Arnick. So it is definitely a, a game that kind of makes you nervous uh, with all the options mm -hmm. out there in front of you. There's no hand-holding on this one. No. Um, they, they, they really kind of throw you in the no deep end. No direction. No, they, they throw you in the deep end and you are lost in the jungle of options to choose. Um, now, the great thing about the board game arena implementation is the mouse overs are phenomenal. Oh, yeah. So much information. What I discovered this morning as I was being lazy and not wanting to get out of bed, <laughs> playing it on a small screen on my phone, however, oh, I is can... not a good experience. It need you need the monitor space. You need to be able to look at everyone's boards, see the the the, the main board, the player boards, your cards. There's so much information there that trying to maneuver around on a on a phone mm -hmm. was just a disaster. So I won't be doing that again. <laughs> <laughs> so a table hog, even digitally, that's, that's impressive in a way. That board's massive. I don't know if you've seen the pictures we've been showing yeah, yeah. Hearing so far. And we're only playing two player. Like you got to squeeze in two more players. It's going to be another one of those games where I wish I had a square table so people could be on all four sides again. Right. Uh, overall, really enjoying it. Like, like it's so far so good. Really enjoying it. Uh, seems to work great. Two and three players. Now that I've seen both player counts, I assume four is just as good. Um, what has been really neat to see is watching people fumble and seeing people try different things. And so far, nothing seems to be terrible. Like, like every, everything seems to have its own merit and, and seems to work well enough. Um, it's not often that I find what I would call a point salad, not by Steffenfeld that I really enjoy, but this very much has that feel of you could get points by buying these or buying these or going up here or going up here twice or just by exploring or by collecting tokens and never trading them in. Or I don't know. One, one of the things I wish the game had, though I'd probably break the balance is at the end of the game, you get nothing for anything you have left. That is the one part that feels wrong to me is when I finish the game and I've got 17, oh, and I've never had 17 tablets. I've got two tablets and a, and a weapon left and a Ruby. And I'm just like, there was nothing, nothing at all. I can't get points for those. But again, it's just trying to make you be efficient. Spend them. Like, like don't have collected. Obviously, you played wrong because you collected this stuff you didn't need. And, and, and that was another one of the things that I've now learned, having played twice. That was the, the lesson of the second game was don't overproduce because there's no reason for it. Yeah, I had an interesting experience today when I was playing where I, I knew or I was pretty sure there was a path for me to get a bunch of stuff, stuff spent. Mm -hmm. um, but thankfully, as much as we complain about some of the undo functions in Board Game Arena, it works actually rather well on Arnak. Okay. So I was able to, okay, if I do this and this and this, that gives me this and this and this, and that'll get me onto this, which will allow me to do this. 
And oh no, that doesn't work. I needed to do this instead. Okay, so mm -hmm. I go back and I and I try the steps all over again. It takes you all the way back, but nice. it's you know it, I, I was able to work through the steps and I managed to rather than passing with a bunch of stuff in my hand, I was able to use my resources nice. and not uh, and not leave them sitting around. And that the, this to do this to do this is is kind of what that game is. Absolutely. A after the first <laughs> round, even the first round, you do a bit of it, but once yeah. you get to like round two, round three. Yep, absolutely. I think we're in round three, or are we in four now? I think we we I think our next turn is four, or maybe our next turn's four. So next up, I tried some more Doodle Dungeon. I haven't been able to get this to the table due to COVID restrictions, so I'm forget it. Let's play a two player. Let's see if it works. And I gotta say, it worked really well, like better than I thought it would. For some reason, I I thought you would need at least three in the interaction. I think it's mostly because the passing to the left, whereas if you're two players, you just pass to each other. But to be honest, that just made it more in your face, more confrontational. It's like, I'm in your dungeon, you're in mine, as opposed to I'm in his and she's in mine and he's in hers and so on. And it actually worked really well too. So I, I do strongly recommend Doodle Dungeon at two. I got to say the game is so much better on the second play after you see how everything works. Um, I'm still going to stick by my original assessment that people should just dive in. What I think you need to do is make a sample board that's like... I don't know, five by five instead of as big and just kind of show people how it worked, maybe. I don't know. But having played the game once already, dungeon building was completely different. Uh, there was a lot more strategy on where I placed my monsters, where I placed my walls, and specifically knowing the rules for drawing paths that you can only enter a certain cube on your map twice, not three times, was fantastic because that let me set up situations where you had to make a hard choice. You had to go this, you could get this or this or this, and that's it. And and realizing that, that was something I totally missed the first time. And then same with watching the cards when you draft. The first time I played, I just grabbed what I wanted to draw on my map, which the first time just happened to be a bunch of goblins because I didn't know what I was doing and I wanted a bunch of goblins. But no, the how important your deck becomes when you're doing the defense phase where the hero's going through, you're using the cards you drafted to draw to buff your orcs and have your dragons breathe fire and have the opponent's hero drop jump over pit traps that was a very big difference and then tracing the hero's path the other aspect of the game knowing that you want to kill as many monsters as possible and not just take the quickest safest route to the entrance is important to know Though we both kind of failed at killing as many as possible as we both um were, well, maybe we won at designing because we both managed to kill each other's heroes this time around, which I think the first game when we played four players, no hero died. They all got out. But I think we we're all being conservative without realizing that if you don't kill the monster, the opponents get points and goblins are dang easy to kill. So you should probably try to hit all the goblins. When I did my path this time, I actually doubled back to make sure I attacked every monster twice, which may not have been the best choice. What I probably should have did was do some math in my head and figure out that if, if I fight all these guys twice and every one of them hits me, I'll die, then back it up a bit so that just in case the dice go the wrong way. Anyway, overall, dug this game way more the second play, but I still have the same complaint I did the first time. This just feels like it's longer than it should be. Like, I knew this. Like, when I first played, I thought flip and right, quick, filler, fast, furious, flip cards, draw stuff, see who won. It's not that. And I knew that this time, but it still felt longer than it should be. And that's like an obscure, like, I can't quantify that. Like, we knew that going in. We knew it was a longer game, but it still took us over an hour to play through one game. I, it's important to realize this isn't a filler, but even realizing it, it's just something about, I don't know, John Kovalik's art makes you think light and fluffy, because it does. Something about the theme, there's just, this is not the light filler I guess I want it to be. Not that it's bad, like, I'm enjoying it. It just every time we play it, we're like, oh, my God, how many more cards do we have to draft? You draw 14 times. That seems like a lot. And when you're drawing, you're drawing more than one thing. You're drawing multiple monsters or placing treasure or drawing walls or leveling up your stuff. Yeah, the, the time weight expectations compared to uh, the reality is just a strange one that's hard to wrap mm. your head around. You look at that box and you think, great half hour fun dungeon romp drawing yeah. game and it's not but no. there's no way that you look at that box and don't think that correct 
I want you to try this one just to see if you get the same thing. Like you've now heard me mention how long it is. If you'd also be like, okay, we've done how many cards are left? Like if you're still having that, how many? Although other times I'm like, I wish I need more cards. I need to draw a wall here or else my whole thing doesn't work. Right. Next, I have what I think may be the oldest game we've ever talked about on the show. And I'm almost positive this is true. Well, I guess we've like talked about chess and we talked about indigenous games from indigenous game designers. But at least as far as games we played, um this one was published by aladdin games way back in 1972 yes it's actually even older than black box which i do know we talked about on the show in the past which i thought might have been the oldest. now this is a game called triples now this came from my parents house and was found when we were cleaning it out to sell the house it's been sitting on my pile of shame since then so it's been there for a long time but i figured it sat at my parents for how long so i guess it's fine <laughs> so we grabbed it the other night on a whim well, I got to admit, it could have used a wash before we played. It looked to be in good shape. I saw the rules were like, you know, four pages. So I'm like, I can read this while we get it all set up. So we set it up. And one of the first things that caught my attention is just how well made the game was. And like, it just, a, a black box is the same. Like it's, it's this plastic tray with plastic tiles with etched arrows on them and clear acrylic tiles for the playing pieces that were thicker than most board game cardboard. Everything was just really well designed and and tight, and I was really impressed by it. And and I don't know, like part of me thinks like they don't make games like this anymore with this much plastic. But then I look at the cool mini games with all the plastic in them, and it's I guess plastic's not the problem. <laughs> but like nowadays, these would have been cardboard tokens on a cardboard board. I swear, I bet. Right? It's the same reason Grinto doesn't have a base to put all those tiles on. So anyway, so the ways. Start the game, you put starting spots in the corners and finishes in the opposite corners. And it's circles versus squares. You then take all the tiles, and there's like 64 of these or something like that, and they all have three arrows on them. And what there is, is there's every possible combination of three arrows pointing to exits off a square. So all your, what, eight? Is that eight? I think that adds up to eight. Eight possible directions, three different arrows, and all possible combinations. And there's two ways to play. You can randomly build the board or you can strategically build it while you place them. We kind of did a bit of both. I think I wish we had just done randomly. <laughs> so you do that. And then there's some blank tiles that go in the middle of the grid that make it so you can't just go directly across. Then we realized we were short six or so tiles and we couldn't actually complete the board. So that was disappointing. But I had read the rules at this point and they sounded solid. So we tried it. So all we did was we eliminated one column and shifted everything over once. And I got to say, the game was good. Like, this was one of those, wow, this is brilliant. Like, like how is this game not out still? How has no one not kept up this? Is It must be out of patent, and it's probably the trademarks not being enforced, to go back to early in the episode. I am surprised no one is marking this game. So the way it works, as like I said, every tile's got three things on it, and all of the, the basic thing is, you go from your start, you're trying to get to your finish. Whoever gets the finish first wins. When you move, you move what's under your opponent's tile. That's it. You move based on the three arrows under your opponent's tile. You move, then they move based on three arrows under your tile, and you're trying to get to the end first. It's all about strategy and planning ahead and has a very chess-like feel. Um, there are even special rules that if you can get both pieces into an infinite loop, you win. There's also rules if you can get it, so it's a stalemate where neither place can move, you can win, and there's some other rules that basically break all the possible problems with the game and makes them win conditions. So you actually try to break those rules. Honestly, it was like when I pulled out Black Box and I was like, man, this game's really solid. I wanted then well, Black Box is still being published some parts of the world, it's not here. This like game from 1972 was fantastic. I really wish we had a complete copy of this. Like, like I, I would be breaking this out, going, check this game out. It's older than me. This is really neat. Now, maybe had I played five, six times, I'd be like, oh, there's a definite strategy or something. But I can't see it because of the random tiles. So what I do want to do is call out. If anyone has a couple copy of triples or pieces for triples, reach out to me, please, because I would love to complete my copy. Though I admit I'm not paying any collector's prices for it because I could go on eBay right now and buy a complete copy for 10 bucks. If it wasn't for shipping, I would have done that already. Fair enough. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? All right. So this week I had two packages show up. We got one here and one here. 
We're going to be opening these up after the uh, in the after show. So anyone here in the chat, feel free to stick around to see what's in those packages. Uh, that's going to lead to more unboxings. We're going to we, we're now going to have enough games to start doing some unboxings again. To get those done. Uh, as far as game playing, um, Deanna is already saying in the chat that we should be playing Arnak as after the show ends, maybe after Boba Boba Fett. Um, so I expect some Arnak to happen. Um, as well as finishing up our online game and doing a rematch now that we all know how to play. Um, I would like to play Doodle Dungeon with the kids. That's what I haven't done yet. Um, if I do get to play with the kids, that might lead to a review next week. Um, what I am going to do is try to see if there's a way Sean can play online, though I don't think there is. I, I didn't see anything out there, but I'll dig around. I still haven't gotten Hero Quest to the table yet. Maybe that'll happen this weekend. I would like to get that played, introduce it to the kids. We'll see. Um, I, I don't know. I guess as usual, no solid plans. Just hope to play some games that it will be a mix of the from the pile of obligation and personal piles. All right. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Evan Reno. Thanks, Tech. Timothy Smith. Thanks, Timothy. Pat and Tori, we miss gaming with you. William Fisher, thank you. Danielle Thomas, thank you, Danielle. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find our podcast on your podcatcher of choice, and sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. Oh, of course, we also have a Patreon at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. The main reason I point you there is to get awesome, cool bonus stuff like bonus audio and access to our Discord, which I can't say is hopping, but is active enough and gets you to interact with other awesome Tabletop Bellhop fans. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us. And be sure to stick around and join us in the Bedhouse Suite for the after show. And stop by on YouTube Sundays for brunch. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.